evening. Good to see you all. Um, we're going to continue with James. Last time we finished off in James chapter James chapter twa, uh, 1 verse 12. Not James chapter 12. You're going to struggle to find that one. All right. Um, let's just pray together before we get into it. Lord, we, we come to you tonight and Lord, we do need you to to be with us, Lord, um, both to understand what we're studying tonight, Lord, and to see the practicality in, in our lives and where we need to change and apply more of this in our lives, Lord. Thank you for this privilege, Lord, to be able to be together and to exhort one another to love and to good works and um, to be able to better be better, better equipped, Lord, to serve you. Lord, we thank you for this time and we ask that you please bless it and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, James chapter 1 and verse 12 is where we finish. So let's just read verse 12 together again just to get some context. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So we were mainly looking last week at um, the concept of trials and how this man who endures trials when he um, or endures these temptations when it, um, and how he gets through these temptations, how he gets through these trials, and how it's God's wisdom that grows faith in him and how you then persevere through these, these trials. Now what's going to happen in verse 13 is a slight, can I say, change in the word usage tempted or temptation. We looked at the Greek word perasmos, which is the word which is translated temptation. And I told you this word perasmos includes the putting to proof by experiment. So it includes the trial side, but it also includes the temptation side. Now from verse 13 down, we're going to be looking more specifically at temptation in how you're tempted to sin. And we'll see the process of sin and how this comes about. So we're not talking about the trial in the sense that your faith is being tried and God can bring this trial. We're looking at something a bit different in the verses to come. Um, so in verse 13, he switches the emphasis to temptation. And um, as with our context throughout verses 1 to 12, we could easily see why it was talking about a trial and not so much this temptation through lust to sin. The context will also make it clear as we go through these verses that this is talking about um, temptation to sin. So let's look at verse 13. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when this lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So you can immediately see it's a different, it's not the trial we were talking about, it's this temptation to sin. Um, and this is an important differentiation because it says in verse 13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. In Genesis chapter 22 verse 1, it speaks about Abraham. And it uses the word there that God tempted Abraham. Now, if this is speaking about temptation to sin, in Genesis 22, as it is speaking about in James, we have a contradiction. Because here it says God doesn't tempt any man. But in Genesis 22, it speaks about specifically God tempting Abraham. But have a look at Hebrews, just a few pages to the left. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and um, verse 17. This essentially comments on the event of Genesis 22 where God t told Abraham to go and sacrifice his son. It says it in Hebrews 11:17 says by faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac. So if you could want to see this as a commentary on the event that took place in Genesis it speaks about Abraham being tried of God. He was tried. And this trying that God does is for a purpose. It's to grow your faith. So God, yes, He does allow trials. Think of, Jan or think of Job. He allowed those trials. But God did not tempt Job to sin. God's desire through that was never to get Job 
to commit a sin. In verse 13 of James it says, For God doesn't tempt any man, um, it cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Um, God allows trials. He even allowed it in Jesus' life. If you think of Matthew 4, where the, in Matthew 4 verse 1, it speaks about the Spirit, after Jesus' baptism, leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And those are the words. The Spirit leads so that he can be tempted by Satan. So God can use other things to tempt us, to, to go, take us through this trial. But he was preparing Jesus for the ministry in Matthew chapter 4. So it's always with a fruitful goal in mind when God tries. He has a fruitful goal in mind. Never um, sin. Um, so the, I think the lesson for us is to see God in the trials, but never blame Him for the sin that might result from our own weaknesses. Okay? See God in the trial. Know that He's at work. But if your weakness leads to sin, it's not because of God. It's because of our weakness through that. So temptation to sin comes from one of our three enemies. And in James chapter 3, verse 15, you should also note from basic discipleship that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. In James chapter 3, verse 15, you, you see this world, this um, earthly, fleshly, and devilish um, enemies of us. And we are to resist and to fight these enemies. Um, and this is why verses 14 and 15 and 16, we'll see how we are to fight against these enemies of ours and how to understand this process of sin because if we understand the process of sin we know how to identify the things where the temptation comes where the problem is and where it leads to where it specifically leads to sin now something that i just want to mention sort of in passing by on verse 13 is the doctrine of impeccability now the doctrine of impeccability essentially is the um, the inability of god to sin it's the inability of God to sin. Now, a lot of people say Jesus was unable to sin. Because if Jesus is God, okay, God cannot be tempted, neither tempteth he any man. So he cannot be tempted with evil. Now, a lot of people use that to say, okay, Jesus was never tempted. That is not the case. In Hebrews chapter 4, have a look, you're there. Hebrews chapter 4. Um, even just referencing Matthew chapter 4 just now. Jesus was tempted. But in Hebrews chapter 4, it speak, in verse 15, it speaks about, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. So, Jesus could be tempted. Unlike God, who cannot be tempted with evil. Because Jesus took on the form of a servant. He became like us. He was fully God and fully man. So he had, I almost want to say, he knew everything there is to know about creation. But as a child, he had to learn to write his name. It's like the concept of being fully God and fully man at the same time. And so this, Jesus didn't have sin, but he could be tempted. And that's important for us to know because if we look to Christ as our example, we need to be able to know that the temptation he faced was real. But he had victory over it. All right. All right. So Christ is able um, to sin. And he was tempted, but he never sinned. All right. Verse 14 and 15. As I mentioned, we're looking at the process um, of sin. Now, this is a, a six-step process, which um, I, I learned from Pastor Mike. I'm sure he learned that from someone else. I don't know. <laughs> but the... The process of sin. Now, when I see a six-step process, I immediately think of these prosperity preachers who give you a seven-step plan to your dream. Now, this is just the inverse. This is like the six-step plan to a nightmare. So, um, <laughs> so this is very important to understand because it will help you greatly to fight against sin. So, this six-step process starts. Step number one is presentation. Presentation. And the presentation to sin is essentially um, something you get confronted with something and you wonder what this is. Um, what, what is this all about? Okay, so you get presented with it. But the st step that follows from that is illumination. 
illumination. And you see that flowing in verse 14. It says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. This illumination is this enticed aspect. Someone explains the presentation. So you get confronted with this thing. It's not sinful yet that you've been confronted with it. But now you start probing a bit into it. And so you get enticed. It gets illuminated. It gets better um, presented to you. And now as soon as it's been illuminated, step three is contemplation. Contemplation. Now this is where your sinful nature starts um, kicking in. And lust begins to draw. That's what we see in verse 15. Lust then begins, oh, verse 14, sorry, uh, it begins to draw you. Now, your sinful nature, as you'll, be, as you'll be very familiar with, is contrary to, if you're saved, what your spiritual nature wants, if I can put it that way. Your spirit, you want to please God, but there's another law, as Paul refers to it, that is contrary to that. Now, um, when this contemplation starts, I want to say this is the debate stage, right? This is where we see Jesus and Satan. Satan says something and Jesus opposes it. Now, Jesus understood that in this contemplation stage where you get confronted, it's illuminated, you, you have this option. Jesus saw the way of escape. 1 Corinthians Corinthians 10, verse 13. You can turn there quickly. It's a very good verse to to memorize and to know and show to people as you... So 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So this is during the contemplation stage. You have the way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that um, you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You may be able to bear it. He's not going to take you out the temptation. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death. It's that principle of I'm in this temptation. I am in this difficult time. But God will ha- make it. A, I will be able to bear it by his strength. And he will show me the way of escape. And that way of escape makes it bearable. So if you don't know the way of escape, you're going to suffer to that whatever it is that you're tempted. But because Jesus knew the way of escape, it's through God's word. And so he quoted God's word and he stood on God's word. And as you'll know from that temptation, Satan also quoted God's word. But abused the context for the most part. And so we need to know what God says, why he said it, and stand on that. And the way of escape can be, I want to say practical experiences show me that the way of escape can be incredibly doctrinal, but it can be very practical as well. You're tempted to do something, go take a jog, go talk to a friend. Like, that's practical, right? But something else can also be, is there's a misunderstanding of what it means to be victorious through Christ. To be more than a conqueror. What, is it, what does it mean that Christ died on the cross for my sins? It can be a change of mind that also needs to take place. Now after contemplation, you have a decision. We know what Jesus' decision was. But this is when lust conceives. This is the decision stage. The way of escape is ignored. The way of escape is ignored. And then we see in verse 15 that that leads to sin. It leads to sin. Now, sin does not always have to be an outward physical action. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 5? He said, whosoever looks on a woman to lust after has already committed adultery in his heart. All right? And adultery is a sin. So it doesn't always have to, from this contemplation, you make a decision and now it's an outward action. If you have gone as far as to contemplate and, I want to say, realize that thought in your mind... You could just as well have committed that sin. All right? So it's all about um, this, I want to say, this mind, your mind that you need to bring in line with Christ as well. And then it says, and then when sin, when it hath conceived, brings forth death. Now, where there is sin, there is death. Now, I almost want to, I almost want to say it can be, it can be local. <laughs> so if you're not saved, 
I want to say, let's call it local and eternal. Death. Eternet? <laughs> Eternet? <laughs> Not <laughs> internet. Okay. So, if you are unsaved, the sphere of death is that. You will both have local death in the sense that sin will affect your life. Depending on the severity of the sin, it can affect you to the point of death. It can affect those around you. So it has, a, it has a local sphere of influence in this physical realm, but it also has an eternal influence. We're all familiar that if we're unsaved, if we're not saved, the wages of sin is death. And that death is that eternal punishment. But if you are saved, death is localized <laughs> to the local sphere. So you are not immune to, you are not immune to the consequences of sin. We make decisions, we've contemplated, we make a decision, it brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. That can result in someone else's physical death. It can result in you being taken before your time. Any of those things. But it will never translate into the eternal realm. But death is a natural consequence of sin. So, if this process of sin is, or let me say, this if it is unconstrained, um, no. Let me. This is the process of sin, if unconstrained. But God's will is that we constrain it. So, the process will follow all the way through, from the top down, if it's unconstrained. That's the natural course of life. That's the that's our sinful nature. But God's will is that we constrain it. He wants us to depart from iniquity. He wants us to abstain from all appearance of evil. That we walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That is what God's desire is for those who are saved. He wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son. He wants us to be sanctified through the, by the truth and God's Word is truth. That is God's desire for every Christian. But if we do not constrain this process, if we do not know... Okay, someone explained it to me like this. You can't stop a crow from flying over your head. But you can surely stop a crow or even stop a crow from sitting on your head. But you can stop that crow from nesting on your head. All right? And so that's where the difference comes. Temptation is that, that crow that flies. Or, and that even the, the illumination and the contemplation. that You can decide this crow is sitting on you. You can decide to leave that crow there. But there is a way of escape. <laughs> Hit the crow off. <laughs> all right? So get rid of um, or resist that temptation. Resist the devil and he will flee from you <laughs> okay so just because this is the natural cause um, it doesn't mean we automatically will resist the devil it doesn't mean we automatically will depart from iniquity it means that God has laid out this process of sin he has shown us the way of escape he has given us the wisdom if we pray and we ask him as we saw in James chapter 1 earlier all these things he will help us to get through that um, but we need to apply that on a daily basis basis i just want to note something if remember in verse two and four we saw that or two two four we saw that the end of the trial was patience and this there's a fruitful outworking of going through a trial the way god wants you to do it but going through a temptation or trial in the opposite way leads forth leads to sin and leads to death so the one is fruit and the other one is emptiness it's ashes so you want to go through these trials as God has put it out in verses 2 to 4 instead of going it and letting sin have its course. Verse 16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now this err sorry, means to go astray or to be deceived. To go astray or to be deceived. I think therefore the verse applies to the following, both practically and doctrinally. Practically, do not go astray or lose faith because of temptations. Do not err. Do not go astray because of these temptations. But doctrinally, do not be deceived in thinking that God tempts you to evil in an attempt to make you sin. So do not err regarding verse 13 that says God doesn't tempt anyone, neither is he tempted with evil. So do not err doctrinally, but also don't err practically in that you fall away during these times of temptations.
verse 17, every good gift um, and every every good gift and perf every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now this Father of lights term is an old Jewish, exp Jewish expression for God, the creator of the sun, the moon and the stars. You can make reference to Psalm chapter 19 where he speaks about this the firmament of God being put together and all these, these things um, crying out, testifying of his creation. The heavens declaring the glory of God. Um, so, and, but the verse also says there that there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now as far as consistency is involved in, I want to say, under the sun, right? In this world, one of the most consistent things that you'll see is the stars and how the sun rises, and you can clock it perfectly. Um, when it will rise, where it will rise, when it will set, where the moon will be, where the stars, all these things can be perfectly, it's so consistent, it can be mathematically determined years ahead of time. So as far as consistency, this is a very good illustration to use. But God is even more consistent. As far as I know, the previous teaching stopped at... Um, James chapter 1 verse 17, so um, I will continue from there. We were speaking about God being the the father of lights and how that's an old Jewish way of um, referring to God being the creator of the sun, moon and the stars. And a good cross-reference to that is Psalm chapter 19 in verse 1 that says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So it's just that the heavens declare the glory of God. And um, I was mentioning the consistency of under the sun and how the stars, the moon and um, the sun are just the most consistent things under the sun from our perspective. But then verse 17 goes on to say, every good gift comes down from this father of lights. It says every good gift, not some of the good gifts. Every good gift comes down from God, who is the Father of lights. And these good gifts come from Him, not based on our merit. It's purely God who gives it. So the question is, do we um, glorify God in that light? Do we glorify Him for all the good that we have in our lives? Do we acknowledge Him in everything that we have, the friends that we have, the family that we have, the jobs, the opportunities to study, the mind that we have, the health that we have, the hope that we have, the peace with God that we have, eternal salvation. Um, all these good gifts come down from Him and He should certainly receive all the glory for it because without God there is no good. Remember, God is good and without Him there is nothing that is good. God does not just consist of good, but he is good itself. Um, and so the source of all good and everything that is beautiful in this life, everything that is good in this life comes from him. Now, I mentioned briefly earlier that this giving of good gifts, or let me say I alluded to it, um, this giving of good gifts is not just focused on the um, worldly things or this temporal things but also of eternal things and I think the fact that um, verse 17 precedes verse 18 and verse 18 speaks of of his own will begat he us um, by the word of truth referring to our salvation um, I think very much that verse 17's focus has a lot more of an eternal focus in mind when it speaks about every good gift so these good gifts are definitely eternal. They're an internal uh, 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 inheritance, hope, peace. And I think a good reference to this verse would be Ephesians chapter 1, which refers to um, the being blessed um, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Um, and that whole chapter refers to various aspects of our eternal blessings, these heavenly blessings that we have because we are in Christ. Now, verse 18 says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
It is God's will that we be saved. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it is his will that we be saved. Now, how are we saved or how are we born again or begat as verse 18 refers to it? By this incorruptible word of truth. In um, 1 Peter chapter 1, we have in verse 23, 1 Peter 1 verse 23, it speaks about this word of God and its connection to um, our salvation. So in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, we read, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So our incorruptible eternal birth the salvation is by the word of god because this word of god lives and abides for ever so um and this connection is throughout scripture between truth and between salvation and god's word and john 17 17 says sanctify them by thy truth thy word is truth so our sanctification comes from the truth um in Romans 10 verse 17, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our ability, or let me say the faith that we need, or what we need to place our faith in is explained by the word of God. Faith comes by that hearing. And so that hearing is the word of God. So we need God's word in order to be saved. Um because God's word contains all the truth we need to come to faith. And therefore we are never to cease preaching the word of truth. Without it, no one will be saved. And with preaching a different message, although it be moral, although it be nice, um, although it be a self-improvement plan, it is just going to create more group three lost people. People who have... Um, a, uh, can I say a, a mental assent to the truth of Scripture, but have absolutely um, no practical outworking of that faith, and they are deceived and they are lost. We don't want that. So we preach the truth, we preach the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, in verse eighteen, it says, "Of His own will begat He us by the word of truth." Now, sometimes people of the reformed background we use this verse to say that um, it is purely God's work that we are saved his will therefore we are begot now I do agree that it is God's will for us to be saved um, but this verse says it clearly and from my understanding that it is God's will that we be saved by the preaching of the word of truth so I don't think there's any anything wrong, <laughs> any contradiction in this verse. God's desire is that we all be saved. And the means by which he saves us is by the preaching of the word of truth. You can have a look at that in Romans chapter 10, where it speaks about this preaching of the gospel that needs to be preached by a preacher and who is sent by God. And it is through that that people... Um, can believe that in, in the message of the gospel and be saved. So I don't think there's any um, anything confusing about this verse. It is God's will that the word of truth be preached and thereby people should be saved. Now, it speaks about the first fruits in verse 18. First fruits are these creatures. Now, first fruits can mean the first, or it does mean the first fruits that came forth from the preaching of the gospel. And that would mean chronologically the first church, this church that James was speaking to, this early church um, uh, being the, the first church, being the pastor of this first church. Um, but the first fruits in the Old Testament was also the offering that the people would bring um, as soon as their fields would bring forth fruit. And so as soon as the fruit started coming, they would offer these fruits in faith before the rest of the field is bringing forth fruit so it's to a large extent it is a it is a a faith offering that the future will bring forth um, further fruit 
And so in the same sense, I think we being saved are the first fruits in the sense that there's still more to come. The work is not complete while we are still in this flesh and this, this sinful body. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but you can have a look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22, um, 22 to 25. I'll read that. It says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of the body. So we're waiting for that redemption of the body. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So there's this patience waiting for the redemption of the body. It speaks about in verse 23, that first fruits of the spirit. Um, and so I think there's a, a great parallel between Romans 8 and James chapter 1, speaking about this first fruit um, and this hope that we have, that the fact that we are saved is just the foretaste of what is yet to come. Um, and so because of this, we endure trials joyfully because we have that hope of a future. Now, in verse 19, um, James changes the the subject a little bit um, and he goes into sorry one of the next divisions one of the next tests tests of true faith and this is the test of the response to the word how do you respond to the preaching of God's word so in verse 19 it says wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear slow to speak and slow to wrath so this wherefore um, is essentially following up on verse 18 by saying for this reason. So because you are saved, because you are begotten, because you have this future hope, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. We should live differently be because we're saved. We should live differently. And this different life. Um, James starts explaining in verse 19. And then as we go down, we'll see how he refers to this different life. But the first thing he mentions in verse 19 is that one way to be different is to speak less and to listen more. Um, we'll deal more with the subject of our tongue and our words um, when we get to James chapter 3. But if you just look at James um, chapter 3 briefly James chapter 3 verse 6 says the following and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell so this tongue is a fire that a world of iniquity um, and so we need to be swift or let me say, if you are being swift in your speech, instead of being swift in your hearing, you are opening up a world of iniquity. And this especially increases your chances of wrath. Verse 19 says, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So if you are not swift to hear, but you're swift to speak, you're going to be swift to wrath because it opens up this world of iniquity someone once said that we would be wise to taste our words before we spit them out taste your words before you spit them out and i think that is essentially what james is exhorting these christians to do these brethren to do in verse 19 so in verse 20 he's going to explain why it's a good idea to avoid the wrath being slow to wrath um in case you were thinking that it is not a good idea, he gives you a reason why it is. And verse 20 says, For this, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Essentially, getting angry is not going to make things right. And it is not going to make those you are speaking to act right. So you want to be slow to speak. Because if you speak 
rash, if you're rash in your speech, you are going to say things you don't want to say. You are not going to make things right by speaking in that state that you're in or um, having th thought through your words. And you doing that is not going to make others behave right. So righteousness, God being ultimately right, holy, pure, that is not what's going to be the fruit. In fact, it will be the opposite. Wrath's tendency is not to incline us. Now, remember, we're talking about righteousness. Okay, Worketh not the righteousness of God. So wrath's tendency will not incline us to that righteousness. It doesn't incline us to live according to God's law. But wrath makes us more inclined to break it. Wrath does not induce us to embrace the truth. But wrath rather wants us to oppose the truth. And so this does not result in righteousness. And so that is why we don't want to end up where we are wrathful. And the one way in helping you not get to that point where you're that angry is by being swift to hear and slow to speak. Verse 21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now I love this superfluity of naughtiness. It needs to be um, <clears throat> pronounced in a British accent. Superfluity of naughtiness. Um, now once again we have a wherefore in verse 21. So he's continuing from the preceding thought. Essentially, because the wrath of man is contrary to the righteousness of God, that's what we saw in verse 20, we should lay aside all these things which stir up wrath and replace it with meekness. So, because wrath is contrary, we need to put the things aside, lay them aside, these things that stir up wrath in us. And these things are filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness. Now, filthiness, um, you can think of as any unright. So we're talking about righteousness, God's righteousness. So anything that is unright, unrighteous um, behavior, such as pride, wrath, evil speaking, anything contrary to the character of God. Then you have superfluity of naughtiness. Now, superfluity means superfluous um, or excessive. Um, and naughtiness means things of not things of no value. Um, it's often associated with things like wickedness because it has no value. So stay away from unrighteous and excessive vain things, things of no value. Um, lay these things aside. A mind filled with faith, uh, uh, filth, um, this filthiness and these vain pursuits, this superfluity of naughtiness will lead to a life of wrath and unrighteousness. And that is not where we should find ourselves ever. So how do we change this conduct? How do we change our heart and attitude towards God's, um, or let me rather say, you change this conduct by changing your attitude towards God's word. If you find yourself in a degree of filth or vain pursuits, how do you change that? Verse 21 says, um, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Receive with meekness. So you change your attitude towards God's word. It doesn't just say receive the word of God. It says receive with meekness. And the reason it does that is because James is trying to say your attitude in your reading and taking in of God's word is of utmost importance. Your attitude, whether you're proud or whether you're meek when you are confronted with God's word, will affect how it uh, will determine how it affects your, your conduct. A proud heart will not admit his fault and will therefore not line up with God's word. But a meek and a humble and a, a quiet spirit will be say, Lord, teach me. Lord, guide me. Lord, I don't know how, but you do. And so that meekness, when you sit in front of God's word, 
will largely affect how it um, largely determine how it affects you. Because remember, God's word is like a mirror, and we'll actually see that in verse 23 to 25 right now, how God's word is a mirror, and it reflects very much our um, our attitude as well when we when we read it. Now, in verse 21, it says at the end of the verse, it says, which is able to save your souls, obviously referring to God's word, which is able to save your souls. Firstly, notice once again, God's word, salvation, word, salvation. This is consistent throughout scripture. Um, we saw it earlier in verse 18. Um, you can see it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, where Paul speaks to Timothy and he says, um, you have heard, you've had the scriptures from a child. And these scriptures were able to make you wise unto salvation. Um, and so in that context, it speaks about exactly the same type of thing. Now, the reason I point out the saving of your soul is because um, I think it's important to understand that James is not exhorting these brethren, as you refer to them in verse 19, um, to be saved. They are brethren. They are saved. I think James is making a general statement about, about the efficacy of God's word in salvation. So how effective, how, how well God's word is, um, or how closely connected it is to, to salvation. Um, he's not in, he's not saying you guys need to be saved because they are already brethren. But it's just about how God's word is effective in making someone wise unto salvation. And as I said, that is a good reference to that is 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. Um, so I don't think James is addressing a lost crowd. Um, I think he's dealing with group 2 Christians. And um, I think this is really important to understand. Because you're reading about filth and superfluity of naughtiness. Um, you're talking about being slow to speak and slow to wrath and um, that these this wrath doesn't work the righteousness of God. The reason I say it's important to know that he's not talking to lost people is because saved people can be caught up in excessive vain pursuits and um, unfortunately sometimes filthy behavior. This should not be their course of life, but it can be. Um, or let me say, it can be something that is a part of their life. So, verse 22, however, says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So James is quick to say, it can be the case, but it shouldn't be the case. We should all be doers, and not hearers only. Group 2, hearers only, not doers. So he's exhorting this group to, to say, Guys, we need to be doers, not hearers only. Um, the natural course should be flowing from hearing to doing. That's the natural course for the Christian. We receive the word, that's faith. And then, that's verse 20, receive the, um, sorry, verse 21, and receive with meekness. And then verse 22 says, and be ye doers. Now, many have this intellectual faith, this hearing only faith, but saving faith results in practical faith. You see, intellectual um, faith doesn't result in practical faith, but saving faith results in practical faith. So if we could use the groups analogy that, or let me say categorization that we gave in the introduction group, I think Paul, oh, Paul James is saying something like, what will differentiate a group two Christian from a group three lost person is how he acts on what he hears or is exhorted to do. How he acts on what he hears. A group two Christian will act out when he's exhorted. A group three Christian will not. Oh, let me say group three Christian. Group three lost man who seems 
religious will not. Now, that doesn't mean the group two Christian will respond immediately and change his life forever and never have a dip again. That's not what the verse is saying. But as a course of life over the rest of your life serving God, I think the general inclination or the general direction of your life will be one of exhorting, being exhorted to change and therefore becoming more like Christ. At a different rate for every person, in a different way for every person, but in that direction. And that is what James is saying. Be doers and not hearers only. The reason he says deceiving yourselves, verse 22, deceiving yourselves, I think confirms this group two and three um, that James is speaking to. Because a man who keeps living, as explained in verse 21, and shows no practical faith, but only remains a hearer of the word, deceives himself regarding his salvation. A group three person thinks that they are saved purely because of the intellectual or the mental ascent they have um, and that they've heard the gospel or heard the teaching of scripture. And because they've heard or they have some sort of religious um, background, therefore they think they are okay. And um, they've deceived themselves. And if, if you've done any type of witnessing and speaking to people, you will be very familiar with this idea of people thinking they are saved because of some religious act that they do or because of something in the past that has happened to them um, or whatever the case is. But there's no real practical faith. And so these people are deceived about their eternity. They're deceived about their salvation um, this group three man proclaims real faith because he's heard it enough times but he remains lost and this is exactly where satan wants to keep people and this is why satan has no problem with religion in fact i think satan is quite a um, proponent for um, for religion because it keeps people in that state of deception, thinking they are okay um, when they are not saved. Now, verse 23 to 24 says, For if any man, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So this is essentially an illustration of what we just read in verse 22 where the people are exhorted to be doers and not hearers only and so James illustrates it with a man looking at himself in a mirror seeing and then departing without any change but before we dig deeper into this illustration I want to point out the word beholdeth himself um, he, this word behold means to observe to understand and to consider attentively, um, attentively, sorry, observe, understand, and consider attentively. This is not referring to a casual look uh, or a quick glance where you just walk past the mirror, see yourself and realize it's still you. <laughs> um, this is an attentive pause, um, a, a deep understanding look at yourself it's care this a careful observant pause and so there is full opportunity to see fault full opportunity to see fault someone who has taken a careful look at god's word in this way and has heard the preaching of it in this way but still chooses to ignore the conviction of the spirit or to act upon it has deceived himself so if you've you've really attentively and understandingly paused and looked into the word of god and heard the preaching of god of his truth and you walk away and you choose to ignore that conviction that is deception because you have full opportunity you have heard but you have not practiced now, what does this deception look like? It looks like a man who carefully studies his appearance in a mirror, sees all the faults, and still walks away thinking 
he looks good. He has no recollection of what he just saw in the mirror. All the problems, all the mistakes, all the things he needs to fix. His hair that needs to be cut. Yes. His, um, whatever that needs to be done to his face. Um, he looks, he sees, but he doesn't do anything about it. And then as soon as he leaves the mirror, he forgets what he looked like. That is deception. That is absolute deception and dead faith. And that characterizes a group three audience. Someone who's looked deeply, spent time, <laughs> listened to God's word and not changed. That is a group three lost man. It is pure mental assent to the truth with no practical outworking. However, the group two Christian, after taking a deep look into the word, is spurred to change. That word look means to, to stoop down, literally to stoop down and inquisitively inquire and look at this thing. A Christian who takes such a deep look will definitely change from a group two direction towards a group one direction but it requires a look a stooping down that's what the greek word behind look is a stooping down pausing and inquiring and unfortunately many group two christians remain group two christians because they don't look they don't stoop down. They don't take the time to spend time in God's word and the preaching thereof. And therefore, they never change. But if you expose yourself to God's word and if you spend time in his word, he will certainly help you grow in the direction of a group to Christian and um, becoming more like his son. Verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty... Um, and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now it says, but, but whoso looketh. So in other words, he's contrasting it to this man who's deceived himself by looking, but not changing. That man is deceived. Now he says, but on the other side, whosoever looks, continues therein, is a doer of the word, this man will be blessed in all his deed. God will bless such a man who remains faithful in his word and, um, um, and applies his word. A good cross-reference to this is Psalm chapter 1. I'll read verse 1 to 3 for us. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh um, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Right? This is the blessed man. So in other words, he's already separated himself from the conduct of the world. He's laid apart this filth, the superfluity of naughtiness, by separating himself. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's exactly what we just read in James chapter 1 verse 25, that law of liberty. Um, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. There's that continuing in um, um, in the word, which we just also read in verse 25. And now Psalm chapter 1 verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That sounds like a blessed man. And that is what we should desire. But the only way that happens is by this, I want to say this system being followed through where you hear, you continue, you do, and therefore you're blessed. Now, it speaks about this law of liberty. Now, first of all, law and liberty are, at least as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, sort of opposites. Um, a law is a strict set of rules you know that we should follow whereas liberty is not the absence thereof but it's freedom to do what you want um and law and liberty but this speaks about the law of liberty so 
quite an interesting statement. So I think two things that I want to point out on law of liberty is one, the first thing is that the presence of grace, the presence of this liberty that this verse speaks of, is not, does not mean the absence of moral law. Presence of grace does not mean absence of moral law. Okay, there's law and liberty. The one doesn't exclude the other. So I think when we speak about the presence of grace not being the absence of moral law, it's something like this freedom from sin which we have in Christ. That liberty results in a freedom to serve God, serving and falling in line with God's requirements for service. So you have law and liberty. You're free from sin. There's your liberty to serve God. Um, being more, can I say, the law side of things. And good cross references to these are Romans chapter 8 verse 2. Um, we're not going to look at those for the sake of time. But Romans 8 verse 2. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Um, Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Um, and First Peter chapter two verse sixteen. So it's Romans eight two, Galatians five one and thirteen, and then First Peter two, verse sixteen. Now the second thing that I want to point out on the law of liberty is that law can take on two forms. Um, the word law can either be prescriptive or descriptive. Now prescriptive is to prescribe something, like for example the Old Testament law, where you have Thou shalt, thou shalt not. That's prescriptive. But then you also have descriptive, like the law of gravity, which essentially speaks of the way in which something will behave itself. It describes a certain behavior. Like, because the law of gravi gravity exists, if something falls, it falls at a certain rate. Or if something is no longer supported, it will fall. That is, it describes uh, behavior. So there's prescriptive and descriptive. Now, this law of liberty, I personally think, is more of the um, descriptive side. Descriptive. The reason I say that is it describes the way in which a person who is liberated responds to the word of God. That's what verse 25, I think, is all about. Describing the way the liberated man responds to the word of God. Because he's liberated, therefore he continues in the word of God. And because he's continuing in the word of God, he is a doer of what the word of God is saying. And because he is a doer, he is blessed. So the one flows from the other. So it describes this liberated man's way of life. But if you take the prescriptive position of this law... I think it can also make sense to say that a, a liberated man should continue in God's word and should um, do what God's word say. And if this liberated man continues and does one plus the other, it equals being blessed. And that's more of the prescriptive. So continue as a prescription and do the word of God as a prescription will result in being blessed. Either way, using your liberty, which you have in Christ, freedom from sin, using it to serve God is one of the happiest, one of the most blessed things that any person can do. Now, verse 26 says, if any man um, among you seem to be religious. This is this, can I say, group three man. He seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. So he's failed the test of um, hearing and doing. So he seems religious. He hears, he speaks in a certain way, but he doesn't bridle his tongue then we see the word again, but deceiveth his own heart. There we see that deception again. Because he hears, but he never does, he's deceived. Deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. There's a form of religion. 
it seems or it sounds legit, but there's no show thereof. In other words, it is vain or it is empty. That's what the end of verse 26 says. This man's religion is vain. It's empty. It has no substance. This is not the way it should be. The real proof is in how this religious man acts outside of the religious setting. You see, it's easy for this religious man, this group three man, to, while he is in the presence of other believers, to speak religiously. <laughs> but as soon as he's outside of that setting, what does his speech sound like? If he doesn't bridle his tongue outside of that religious setting, the chances are pretty good that he is a group three man. And we also, as Christians, need to be careful that our speech is consistent. Whether we're at church or not at church, it doesn't matter. We are consistent. We serve God with our mouths, and that is wherever we are. Um, so I think what we need to ask ourselves is, is the content and the manner of our speech before believers, where we need to seem religious, and before unbelievers, the same? This is one of the tests of true religion. So I'll leave that to God's Spirit to show us if we are at fault. Or failing this test. Now verse 27 says pure religion. So in contrast to verse 26. This man that seems religious. Pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now this word pure means unmixed. Okay. Religion, so this is an unmixed religion, is when a person who professes faith is doing something about that faith. So there's harmony. It's, it's unmixed. It's homogenous. It's, whereas the opposite would, of that would be is, to be is to be mixed and to be filthy and to... Like you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but you want unmixed, you want pure, pure religion. And that is when the professing is consistent with the doing. So it's not a little bit of theology mixed with worldly living. Living That is not pure religion because there's a mix. It's rather, it's a life that lines up with its theology. So you know what God's word says about something. That's your theology. And therefore your life lines up with what you know to be true. And you can see this in the illustration or the example that he gives about the widows and the fatherless. By saying you feed and take care of the widows and the fatherless. There you have your works, your practical, your doing of the word. But then you also have on the other side, you have your um, keeping yourself unspotted from the world which is your sanctification or can i say the spiritual side of this this coin you have your theology and then you have your doing of of the word now something that came up just as a question in last night less last lights <laughs> last night's lesson was um why specifically use fatherless and widows as an example now i think the reason for that is remember the crowd that james is speaking to he's speaking to these believers who are scattered um, away from their home away from their church away from their pastor because of the persecution that they were facing and so i think chances are quite good that a lot of fathers um, have either been persecuted to the point of death um, or they had to separate as families. And so it's the church's responsibility to step in and take care of those people who are most vulnerable. And um, that is certainly one of the ways in which you can do good um, based on the truth. So I think that's that. And then also something else that um, 
that was Pastor Mike also mentioned is just the consistency of this illustration with what we read in um, in James chapter 2 where it speaks about in verse 15 if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them depart in peace be warmed and filled but you don't do anything to help them be warmed and filled that is dead religion um, that is dead faith and so you want to act your deeds need to be consistent with your profession with your with your conduct all right i hope that has been a help and a blessing sorry for the divided um lesson tonight but um i hope that the truth of the god's word is still um beyond all these these things and these hiccups and that uh, this will be a blessing to you let's just pray together lord thank you once again that we can open your word and um Lord, be exhorted. Um, truly, this book is a book that um, is alive and exhorts us and um, encourages us to to live in a different way, um, to to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, please help us to do that. And we know that our conduct is stems from how we look into your word, as we saw tonight, that we would really stoop down. That we would have, that we'll look atten- attentively, Lord. That we'll, that we'll um, look in an understanding way at your word, and really approach it with meekness. And Lord, we know that you will help us to bring forth the fruit that we should when we spend that time with you. Thank you so much for your word, and Lord, we pray that you please bless, help us to be that that blessed man that we read about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.